Hello, everybody. OK. Uh, so good day to everybody. We'll be talking about Cyborg today. Cyborg is an open stack project to handle accelerators. So we'll be looking at the general data center trends which require the uh, need for accelerators in the first place. And we'll be looking at some typical use cases for having accelerators. We'll be having an extra focus on the FPGAs because they're typically a bit more complex and mo have more requirements compared to GPUs and other devices. So we're taking an additional look at that. And then we'll look at how OpenStack Cyborg architecture actually realizes those use cases and what we plan to do in this time release. Okay. And feel free to stop me at any time uh, if I'm going too fast or too slow. All right. So let's first look at why we are even looking at accelerators in the first place. So if you look at the traditional data center workloads, if you're running a database or a mail server or something, your traditional Xeon type of server processors are good fit for that. In fact, they're optimized for that. That's what we've been using over the decades. But there are new and emerging workloads which are very compute intensive, executing a general purpose processor. So for example, if you take machine learning or video transcoding or any other newer ones, they tend to consume a lot of cycles. So we can optimize Xeon by implementing new instruction sets like AVX, et cetera. But beyond a point, it's more uh, performant and power efficient to offload this computation to other devices like GPUs or quick assist or FPGAs and so on. So there is an increasing trend towards using accelerators in data centers. You might have heard about Microsoft using FPGAs. Uh, of course, GPUs are very, very common. When you say accelerators, people actually think of GPUs, of course, normally. You might have heard of TPU from Google, the TensorFlow processing unit. Amazon has something called Nitro, which is to offload the host level processing of things like network uh, packet processing to accelerators. So talking of FPGAs, they seem to be increasing in the news. A lot of people are deploying them, like Microsoft Azure, for example, uses that. And we are seeing other public clouds, uh, especially in Asia, uh, deploying them recently. So why is that? coming into work these days. So FPGAs are pretty old technology. It's been there for many decades now, but they're kind of getting a new wind, a second wind these days. The reason is this. If you want to offload a computation, your broad choice in terms of hardware is either an ASIC or a programmable device like an FPGA. If you compare the two, ASICs have a higher initial cost, because you've got to do a design, you've got to prepare your mask and all that stuff. So You've got to spend additional time and design effort up front. It takes more effort to get that first unit off the block. But once you do that, every additional ASIC has a relatively small incremental unit cost. Whereas if you look at FPGAs, the initial startup is not that much. You just buy an FPGA off the market and start working with it. Uh, and after that, beyond a certain point, you'll find that the unit cost is actually a little higher in terms of the incremental margin cost. So that's a kind of a uh, flip over at a threshold point where ASICs become more economical. But over time, the initial cost of an ASIC is going up. So the threshold for the uh, blue line is going up in the, in the, in the starting point. And the incremental cost for FPG is not as high as it used to be. So the, the threshold point is shifting to the right. So the net result is, where we considered FPGAs to be a suitable fit for prototypes in the past, now it's fit to be used as a regular offload device by itself. Okay? The other major trend we are seeing is that accelerator volumes are getting fragmented. So let's say you are doing HPC. Let's say you want to implement some genomics algorithm like Smith Waterman. It's very unlikely that you'll find enough market to create an ASIC just for that or an ASSP just for that. It's much more economical to use FPGA for that. So the, the fragmentation of the acceleration market is also a factor to note. And the third big factor is that FPGA is very versatile. They actually come with various I.O. transceivers built into them. So you've got PCI and Ethernet, et cetera, built into that. So you can actually implement networking workloads, and you can do a lot of things which other offload devices like GPUs cannot do. So this is why you're seeing FPGAs increasingly emerging. 
but the versatility of FPGAs also means they have put higher requirements on orchestration. You can use them in a wide variety of ways. You can do things like programming them with bit streams, which you cannot do with GPUs. So what it requires from OpenStack and Kubernetes is at a higher level. So we'll be looking at that aspect. Okay. Okay. So if you are an OpenStack user or an orchestration user, what, how can you consume any accelerator, whether it's a GPU or FPG or a quick assist or whatever? So broadly, we consider different categories of offload first. Let's first look at what you would call offload from your virtualization infrastructure. So let's say you're running uh, Nova, or let's say you're running KVM on a host, running much multiple VMs. The packet flow between the VMs needs to be switched, and you typically have something like open B switch running on the host, and that thing is consuming CPU. The act of switching packets or processing storage for your VMs is consuming CPUs. And from an operator's point of view, that's not really a good thing because that's CPU which you could have given to your tenant and charged money for it. So you're actually losing revenue while doing all this overhead. So you want to offload that to save your CPU for what it matters, right? The other reason or other way you can offload is from the application. So from a VM or a container or for that matter a bare metal process, you may want to offload your computation to a device. And of course, it could be any application whatsoever. It could be machine learning. Uh, in a telco context, it could be any NFV workload like firewalls and load balancers and routers and whatnot. So these are two broad kinds. So in this talk, I'll be focusing mostly on application offload because that's where we see a lot of the initial interest to begin with. Uh, the scope of Cyborg also includes infrastructure offload in the future, but for now we'll be looking at second category. So in terms of that application offload, how can a user consume a device? There are broadly two ways you can do it. One is what you could call as device as a service. From the user's point of view, you're just asking for a device of a particular type and just wants to use it by himself. So for example, you could say, give me a GPU, which happens to be AMD Radeon 10, right? And I'll just use it. I'll just program it myself. I'll give me an FPGA, which is an Intel Aria 10. I'll just program my own bit streams. So just renting out devices, just using it by yourself. But in the context of FPGAs, there's an additional wrinkle. If you let a user program his own bit streams, I don't know what he's going to bring. What's in the bit stream? If you're an operator, you're going to be worried about uh, facts like you could put a malicious bit stream, which may toggle your transistors too fast and probably cause local hotspots and burn your device out. Or it could do other bad things, potentially. So from the orchestration point of view, we are going to introduce some mitigating factors. Uh, there are two models we can do to address a security issue. One is what I call request time programming, which is that when you make a request, for a VM with, let's say, 16 vCPUs, 128 GB RAM, whatever, and also you ask for an FPGA with a particular bitstream ID attached to it. These bitstreams could be residing in plants, so you're just using or pulling them over. The infrastructure is doing the programming for you as opposed to the VM doing it itself. So there is an intermediary, which is your OpenStack infrastructure, which could validate the bitstream in some form. How you do the validation is a very broad subject. I'm not getting into that. But it, it's at least possible to inject some policies and do some validation. The other broader use case is what we could call runtime programming. A running VM starts asking for bit streams. It says, I want bit stream A now. Let's go and program that and start using it. Data says, I want bit stream B now, and so on. Here again, you want the request to be intercepted by the underlying infrastructure so they can enforce policies and carry out authentication and validation. The third possibility is direct programming. We don't even get into that because it, it freaks operators out. So <laughs> we'll leave that out for now. The other broad category or other broad way in which a user could consume a device is via its functions. So if you are a user, you really don't care about whether it's what model GPU it is and whether it's ARIA 10 with, with this bit stream and whatnot. You really want to offload gzip. That's what you care about. Or you want to offload IPsec. So in the second model, let's say, give me this algorithm or this function. I don't care where it is. Okay. So at a, at, it's a higher level of abstraction. 
we expect this to appeal to a wider variety of audience compared to the first one. The first one is really for more like power users. Um, it's not totally device independent because at some level you've got to say what device drivers you have in your instance image. If you've got a VM with a certain GPU drivers, you can only operate GPUs of that particular class on same for FPGAs or quick assist or whatever. So there is some dependence, but it's at a much higher level than the device as a service model. And from the operator's perspective, we can meet that use, use case in two ways. One is what you could call pre-programmed scenario in which all your functions are already programmed in the case of FPGAs, and you're just providing them. The user can only see them and kind of consume them. You cannot go and program them, okay? Uh, there are a bunch of reasons why you may want to do pre-programming, but that's why. But apart from that, you could also do what we could call orchestration-driven programming, in which uh, the, this is basically the holy grail, in the sense that the user asks for a gzip, orchestration goes about looking for a free gzip instance somewhere in your cluster. If it doesn't find one, it's going to find a blank FPGA somewhere, reprogram them to the right bit stream, and then expose it to the user. The user's point of view, he asked for a function and got it, and all the details are left to orchestration. So we want to include all of these use cases in any orchestration framework, whether it's OpenStack or Kubernetes or whatever. So uh, we'll now look at how we do it in OpenStack. Okay. Looking at Cyborg architecture now and how we are going to realize these use cases. So Cyborg, like I said, is a project for lifecycle management for accelerators in general. It's for various class of devices, like GPUs and FPGAs, et cetera. So we are starting with, of course, the most popular ones are GPUs and FPGAs, but we could bring other things also in the future. As with any OpenStack project, we aim for this to be vendor neutral and also hypervisor neutral, so it's not just for the KVM hosts out there. And there's a link to Cyborg uh, here for those who are interested in that. There are more on the reference slides. Okay. So why do we need Cyborg? So we already have Nova, we already have GPUs used with Nova, so why would we not just do more of the same? So here's the reason, right? So with Nova, you use PCA whitelists. And as many of you can relate, it's kind of difficult to use, right? It's not easy to operate. And more importantly, you are not exposing the device properties per se, you're exposing only PCIDs. So for something like GPU, maybe you can get by with that. But for something like an FPGA, the PCI ID really does not tell you what's inside the FPGA. It could be a GZIP. It could be some telco workload like EPC. So just looking at the PCI ID tells you nothing at all. You need something more. You have to go inside the device and find out what function is programmed or what bit stream is programmed or what could be programmed into it, etc. So this strongly limits what use case can actually realize. And that's what Cyborg sets out to solve. Okay. So what Cyborg does is to have a concept of drivers. I'll get more into that later. But these device drivers, which are provided by the vendors, can go and discover your devices and their properties and publish them to Nova on placement in a, in a standardized way. So your, your device is discovered in a structured way and represented in a structured way. So it can now kind of have visibility into what's in the device. And that enables all the use cases we talked about. Okay. So this is a very broad view of what a Cyborg deployment looks like. The Cyborg could be used standalone, even without Nova. So here's what the de deployment looked like. So the big box here is the compute node. You've got a Cyborg controller sitting off to one side, and there's an agent running on every compute node. And the agent is augmented by one or more drivers. So you could have one driver for, let's say, AMD GPUs, one driver for Intel FPGAs, one for Xilinx FPGAs, and so on. So these are the vendor-provided drivers, and, and we also have the Cyborg drivers to work with them. So the whole apparatus is designed to have the, all the vendor dependence isolated within the drivers. The Cyborg core itself is vendor neutral. Okay. So uh, I'm showing an example of SRIOV device here, but this is really not a PCA-centric approach, although we'll be starting with PCA devices in the initial implementation. So basically, if, uh, if you think of 
SRI over device with physical functions and virtual functions, we could take the physical function and use it for management and orchestration. And the virtual functions could be used for the data plane and assigned straight to VMs or containers. You would also need something inside the VM to operate those devices, but it's a higher level of abstraction. So you would need something like a device driver for the appropriate device in there. If it's a GPU, we need an i915 driver from Intel, for example. And at the application level, so let's say what you want to do is compression, you're doing gzip. You could have an application framework like Snappy, which is a general purpose compression framework. And that application framework could then be written on top of your device framework. So it could do the offloads at that level. The higher level application which uses the framework could be ag agnostic about what's going on underneath. So this provides one level of isolation. Uh, but this is really orthogonal to Cyborg. It's only a, a recommended way of deploying your devices. Okay. So in terms of Cyborg structure, it's structured like many other OpenStack projects. There is an API server which faces the external world. All your requests go through that. There's a conductor also running on the controller, uh, and it talks to a database, which is MySQL, like most of the projects. So this is all fairly straightforward. On the compute node, you've got a daemon called the agent. Uh, somewhat similar to what NOAA compute would do, we would handle devices through Cyborg agent. And the agent has a standardized API to various drivers. So some drivers could be in tree, some drivers could be out of tree. So you, could have, you can combine all of them in a given operator's deployment. And each driver will handle a family of devices. Okay. So putting it all together in how it all fits in OpenStack, on the controller side, on the left, you would see uh, Nova, Glanz, Neutron, Cyborg gets added to that now. On the compute side, you got Cyborg agent. And one thing worth noting here is that Noah talks to Cyborg, but not by directly calling through its REST APIs. It goes through an intermediate library called OSACC. This is based on the same principles as how Noah talks to Neutron or Cinder today. So Noah talks to Neutron through OSWIF, it's a library ex existing today, and to Cinder through OSBrick. And the proposed model here is to use a new library called OSACC to act as an intermediary between Nova and Cyborg. So Cyborg would return something which is totally neutral and not NOAA specific uh, to be used in standalone use cases. And this OSACC would convert that to NOAA specific form to be consumed by NOVA. Okay. So uh, there are various arrows going on here. We'll talk more about that. We'll see how NOVA and Cyborg interact. But before we go into the workflow, we should first look at how do we represent devices in OpenStack? Right? So we already have the notion of placement in NOVA. So with NOVA and placement, we represent compute nodes as resource providers. And the resources they provide are your CPU and memory. Right? And you could represent traits or the properties of the compute nodes as traits in placement. So for example, if you've got huge pages or any other special properties, they become traits. Along the same lines, we want to represent devices as resource providers, and the accelerators within them as resource classes, and this device resource provider will be nested within the compute node resource provider, forming a tree. This notion of nested resource provider has been taking shape in over the past couple of cycles in Queens and Rocky. It's more or less there now, so we intend to leverage that to represent devices. So from a user's point of view, a typical request would list, like give me four vCPUs and 12 GB of RAM, which look like resources. In addition, a class for additional resource classes, like a FPGA accelerator resource class, and the properties would be expressed as traits. So using all your standard NOVA and placement mechanisms and the existing request spec mechanisms, you can phrase your request for accelerators in different ways. Okay, so uh, here's a simplified device model, although it's not look that simple when you look at the slide. <laughs> uh, so basically the idea is that you've got a device. Within a device, you may have several sub-components 
So in the case of a GPU, it could be just a single component, but an FPGA could actually be divided into multiple regions. You can actually configure each region separately and it could contain a separate accelerator. In fact, one region may even contain multiple accelerators. Our definition of an accelerator is a unit of offload which can be independently assigned to a VM. So a single device for G GPU, for example, can contain multiple vGPUs, and each vGPU can be assigned to a different VM. So that will be an example of an accelerator. Similarly, in the FPGA, each region may contain, let's say, a gzip bitstream, which provides four instances of gzip, and each of those instances would be a separate accelerator. So we have a generalized node model of one device with multiple components, which we call deployables, which correspond to resource providers, and each of them could contain multiple accelerators, which are instances of resource classes. And any property of an individual resource provider, like an FPGA region type or a GPU model type, et cetera, would all be traits in this representation. So to make it more concrete, here's an example of how you could do it with the GPU. So the PCA card containing GPU is what will model as a device in Cyborg. Noah doesn't know about it. It's not a placement concept at all, but we have a notion of a device in Cyborg so you can track things like uh, maybe your BMC or flash capacity in your PCA card or whatever. Anything at the card level will be tracked as a device. The actual GPU itself will be a resource provider. And if, if you've got vGPUs, there'll be accelerators within that. If you don't have it, there'll be a single accelerator of GPU class. And your model type, like NVIDIA, Tesla, AMD, Radeon 10, whatever, that, would, that could be a trait. Uh, and if you've got an ASIC, like a quick assist, which may can implement different functions, then the function also can be expressed as a trait. So we're translating the device components to no one placement components. And once we do that, now we can start expressing a request, like I said before. A GPU as a service would look like this in the, in the left box down below. So in the extra specs or in your flavor, you would ask for a resource of the resource class GPU. You're asking one of that, so it's a GPU equals one. And you're putting a constraint that the resource provider providing that resource class should have a particular trait, which is a particular vendor model uh, combination. You're saying it's a required trait. So this combination means that you're just asking for a device and you're going to handle it to yourself. Whereas if you've got an ASIC and you want some kind of accelerated function as a service, you would ask for, let's say, the XYZ ASIC, you want one of that, and you ask for its model to constrain what device drivers you got in the VM to correspond to that. In addition, you may say that I want this ASIC with a particular function in it. Okay? In the case of FPGAs, both types are possible. You could do device as a service as well as function as a service, and it unites both models. So like before, the FPGA PCA called be a device, regions would be resource providers, and there could be multiple accelerators within them, and every property of FPGA of interest would be a trait, et cetera. And the boxes down below would show how you can realize the various use cases using these resources and traits in the context of FPGAs. It's a very similar model. You ask for resources, traits, et cetera. In addition to those, we have a new concept called uh, uh, cyber properties. So if you look at the bottom right, if you want FPGA as a service, and if you want request time programming, as we talked about earlier, you would express the bitstream ID you want as a cyber property. It's basically just an extra spec with a special type of key value pair, which is axle, colon, bitstream ID equals whatever. This is not something that's known to know our placement. It just comes with a request, and it's going to be handled by Cyborg. But in terms of the user request, they all look united in a common format. Okay. 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 So I hope it makes sense so far. Um, if you've got any questions, please do stop me. So, uh, like I said, every one of the use cases, like the left side shows the accelerated function as a service in the pre-programmed case and orchestration program case. So we kind of worked out 
how to realize a workflow for each of these combinations, and how to represent the device as well. Okay. okay, here's another new concept. We are familiar with flavors. Flavors are template for what resources and what kind of a VM you want. But if you put all your device requirements in a flavor, there could be a problem. So you may want various combinations of devices. You may want GPUs of different types. You may want FPGs of different types. For a particular workload, maybe you want eight of a GPU. For another one, maybe you got only four of those. So there could be all kinds of combinations. So you may wind up having one flavor for every combination of those, and that's, uh, that's a problem. We don't want a flavor explosion. So to solve that problem, we factored out the device requirements into a separate thing called a device profile. It's basically just a flavor for devices at the end of the day. It's going to look very similar to flavors. All it is to kind of split the flavor in two and then let it be composed together at runtime. Okay? So a typical example of a, a device profile looks kind of, like, kind of like this. You can group it together. So each group would ask for a resource with associated traits. The reason for having groups is that you want to have some control over which resource provider satisfies this request. So if you ask for two resources in the same group, they'll come from the same resource provider. If you ask for them in two different groups, they may or may not come from the same provider depending on other considerations. If you know about group policy in the granular resource request syntax, the same concept here. So that's a device profile. So how do we put it all together? So what's the actual workflow for no one cyber to work together? So at the start of the day, the operator has to know what devices it's got. So cyborg devices are going to, uh, sorry, cyborg drivers are going to discover the devices and represent them in placement. Once that is done, the operator can create flavors and device profiles. So you could create a device profile for, let's say, uh, GPU small or GPU large, or it could be based on workloads, like here's a machine learning workload, or here's your compression workload, and so on. So you create device profiles for your use case of interest. And then the user asks for a VM with both a flavor and a device profile. Okay? So in the initial implementation, the device profile may be folded into the flavor as an additional property in the extra spec. But in subsequent implementations, you may separate them out as two independent concepts. In either case, the user is asking for two different things, which is a flavor and a device profile. And once you do that, as part of the regular NOAA scheduler flow, NOAA is going to first call into Cyborg, because it, it does see this device profile name being mentioned somewhere. So it's going to call into Cyborg and say, hey, get me what's in the device profile groups. So the, the request includes just the device profile's name, but the details of the device profile sitting in Cyborg's database. So Noah's going to call into Cyborg and get those details. And as part of that, Cyborg also creates something called accelerator request objects, or ARQs. These are roughly similar to what you would uh, find in Neutron, like a port and a whiff put together, roughly. Essentially, it tracks the state of a request for an accelerator, so as it goes between NOAA and Cyborg in various stages, the state of the ARQ will change. And even the terms we use are broadly similar. We're talking of creating an ARQ and subsequently binding it and attaching it. So let me explain that a little bit more. So once you create an ARQ, the NOAA scheduler is going to go through the usual process of querying placement and then getting all the allocation candidates, which would now include the devices, because they are nested resource providers, so the placement is going to return them in the resource provider tree. So now that you've got a list of allocation candidate trees, NOAA scheduler is going to pick one. And once that is done, you know which compute node is going to be used, and you also know which device within that, or a specific resource provider within that is going to be used. So uh, at that point, NOAA calls into Cyborg and says, bind this ARQ, which means bind it to a particular host and a particular device. So at that point, Cyborg is going to go off, talk to the compute node, and maybe program the FPGA or configure the GPU or whatever is necessary. And while that's going on, NOAA goes on in parallel. And it, goes, it calls into the compute node, while it's going to work with Neutron and Cinder and so on. 
At some point, when the instance is about to be launched, the NOAA is going to call into Cyborg and make sure all the ARQs are ready. Programming is done, GPU is configured, everything is ready to go. At that point, the NOAA word driver could then attach the accelerators uh, to the VM. So what Cyborg returns back to NOAA after binding is essentially what we could call an attach handle, like a PCI VF, for example, or a mediated device UID, and that's what gets composed by the word driver into the VM's domain XML. Okay. So the basic primitives are create, bind, and attach. And we think these primitives will work for any combination of operations we can think of, at least within this scope, without going to infrastructure offload and such. So for example, if your instance placement fails, you try to spawn the instance, and the spawning failed for whatever reason. You want to retry on a different host. Then you would unbind the ARQ on that particular host, and rebind the same ARQs on a different host. Similarly, if you do any instance operations like suspend, pause, resume, or any of those combinations, these same primitives should work. And if you've got various failure modes, like something went down somewhere, again, we should be able to use the same primitives to handle all of those cases. Sorry? Uh, no, we would expect them to be the same host. So the device are nested within the compute node, right? So the resource provider tree, you've got a compute node as a resource provider node, and its child would be a device resource provider, and the placement return that tree. They always go together. Okay, so the question is, why does NOAA even need to talk to Cyborg in the first place? Because Cyborg already represented all the devices as providers and resources in placement already. The reason is this, you already represented it, but to actually attach an accelerator, you would need something like a PCI VF or a media device UID. You may also want to program the device in the first place. So for example, if it's a blank FPGA, you may want to apply a GZIP bit stream before the VM comes up. So you have to let Cyborg have a hook in between. Any other questions? Okay. So um, there are m much more detail than what I presented here. There's a whole wiki co covering Cyborg. We have many specs currently in progress. There is one overarching spec in the NOAA specs repository, which covers the overall flow. And many of the subsections are sitting as Cyborg specs in, uh, in the Cyborg repository. You're welcome to look at both. Uh, we also have code in progress, so we have some we already have some minimal, uh, some working code for Cyborg in the Rocky release. We intend to build upon that using this new workflow in the Stein release. And we're always looking for active developers, so if you're interested in this area, please do come and talk to us. Any questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there some um, modifications in the Nova virtual uh, driver so that uh, to facilitate uh, the interface with uh, with PCI device drivers? Yes, we would need some changes in the Nova world drivers. The basic change would be that when the cyborg returns an ARQ with attached handle like a PCI VF, the world driver should be able to process that and use that to attach to the VM. 
are there any plans to move, for example, SRIOV handling into cyber? Cyber does handle SRIOV in the initial implementation itself. If you're talking of all SRIOV, that's, that's not the plan. For networking devices, it'll still be Neutron. With the PCA whitelist handling and so on, for now at least. What Cyborg is handling is mostly accelerated devices with SRIOV. Yeah. Wait, wait. Does, uh, I have a question. Does it, uh, is it possible to hot attach the accelerator into a, a running VM? I'm sorry, can you please repeat that? Just hot attach. Uh huh. Oh, yes. Okay. Hot attach is possible. It's something you looked at. It's, it may not be implemented right now, but this flow should handle that also. Mm -hmm. One of the purposes for extracting a device profile out is that in the future you could say, here's a device profile, that's an existing VM, go and attach all these accelerators to the running VM. Yeah. So it's so on the do. roadmap, yeah. Yes, it's possible, yeah, okay. with the same workflow. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, just a clarification. So let's say that uh, the user wants to perform a, an accelerated function like the CZIP, uh, as we saw before. Uh, uh, can uh, he or she just get uh, the FPGA device or the GPU device, or he or she has to get the VM plus the device? That's a good question. Okay. So what we are looking at right now in this flow is VM plus a device. But for things like infrastructure offload, where you want to just offload from, let's say, OVS switch in the host to the FPGA, we not want a VM at all. You just want to configure the device and assign it to, let's say, something like DPDK in the host or something like that. That is possible in the future with a similar workflow. It would not be the same thing. We can still use the same primitives, I think, to do infrastructure offload. Essentially, during a cyborg binding process, when you go and program FPGA and such, instead of saying that here's the handle for a VM, you would install uh, bind something like a VFIO driver and pass it through to user space where DPDK could use it. Program, yeah. Yeah, so, <clears throat> okay, so one more question. What about the, um, let's say, matrix of the images and the drivers for the uh, underneath uh, functions providing with the FPGA? Because uh, uh, if we have something like uh, uh, using, actually, the accelerator for the uh, specific uh, device, then we have to provide an image with, which mm -hmm. provides some, uh, let's say, uh, drivers for it, right? So. Uh, do we have to provide, like, uh, as an administrator, do we have to uh, prepare images for each of the accelerators? You, you would need the FPGA bit streams for the accelerators of interest. No. Sorry? That's not a question, okay. No, no. I mean, uh, the bit stream is the one thing, but the talking with the bit, bit stream underneath by the system is the, the other one, right? So you have to have an uh, image which boots on the VM, the operating system, which then uh -huh. talks with this um, virtual function somehow. Right. So I, I, I referring to that. Okay, okay, sure. Let's go back to this slide then. Um, so in terms of this slide, yes, you would need something inside the VM which can talk to the accelerators assigned to it, and there could be multiple levels to it. So it could all make it monolithic, but a preferable way to do it is to decompose into different layers. So you could have one layer, which I call the VF driver in this model inside the VM. So that just deals with the bare bones of the PCA interaction. You could have a higher level, like a device API, which deals with the FPGA details or the GPU details and knows about how to interact with that particular thing. And that should expose, ideally, some kind of a standardized API to higher layers for use by, let's say, compression and machine learning and anything. And that would be workload specific. So you would need something workload specific at some point. 
Yes, you could put the accelerated needs in the VM image. One of the issues there is that you may have multiple groups in your device profile. You could be asking more than one accelerator. And if VM image says X equals Z, it's a property you want, you don't know which accelerator it applies to. So there are some things we still need to solve before we get to that. Is there any plan to extend Ironic so it reports the capabilities, you know, FPGA, GPU, and so on, uh, as it does uh, uh, in introspection? It's a good question, yeah. There is definitely interest in getting accelerators in bare metal cases. Uh, we are in the very early phase of interacting with Ironic. We still need to figure out how to do that. So th there is no concrete plan yet, but it's definitely area of interest. There are other things I've not gotten into here in terms of how we do bitstream management, what properties you would need in the FPGA bitstreams to be used by orchestration, what are the roles of bitstream developers, operators, et cetera. That's one whole category. The other category of interest is FPGAs with networking. That's another emerging area. A lot of telco guys are interested in using FPGAs for NFV. Uh, so Cyborg plus Neutron is going to be a thing going forward. As somebody asked, Cyborg plus Ironic is going to be a thing as well. There are people interested in storage of and accelerators. So we can expect a lot of development in this area going forward. Great. Any more questions? Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.